I'm Neil Gaiman, author, screenwriter, storyteller. Today, I'm here to answer your questions from Twitter, and this is Mythology Support. First one, Asaf Mare asks, what links Viking and Greek, gods and myths? It's a lovely question because there are things that are similar, but what really links them, I think, is people. The Greeks told their myths to the Romans and the Romans took over and colonized. And then those same Romans traveled up and encountered the Germanic tribes and the Norse people and traded tales of gods and heroes. The Norse would talk about Odin. The, the Romans would hear was essentially Mercury, which is one reason why our Wednesday, which is Odin's day, right in the middle of the week, is Mercredi in France, which is Mercury's day. It's the same God. Crimson Soul 21 says, if I asked nicely, could I ride a Minotaur like a horse? I'm English, I say Minotaur, Americans say Minotaur, it's weird to me. Could you ride a Minotaur like a horse? No, obviously you could not. You could ride a Minotaur like a man because you have a man body all the way up to a bull's head, but that would mean riding around on his shoulders. Unless you could find a Minotaur into sort of, you know, pony stuff or you probably have to find a furry minotaur, like not a furry minotaur, a minotaur who was actually a furry would get into a horse costume and get down and you could ride that one. This is getting too weird. I'm going to go on to a different one. Seth Prime Urbina, and Seth, of course, is a good Egyptian name, asks, if Egyptians worshipped cats, then why did Anubis have a dog head? Here is a picture of Anubis, to clarify who we are talking about. Technically, he doesn't have a dog's head. I believe he has a jackal's head. I like this question. This is, this is one of those questions. If Egyptians worship cats, then why did Anubis have a dog head? Is kind of like being asked, you know, if, if people descended from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? The answer is because the Egyptians had lots of gods. Originally, you had the gods of the Upper Nile and the gods of the Lower Delta. And one set of gods were human and one set of gods were animals. And at the point where Egypt became all one country, the gods sort of incorporated each other and you got a lot of animal headed humans. From Tiana Marie Underline, who says, after looking up what biblical angels actually look like, I fully understand why they warn you not to be afraid because WTF is that question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. You're right. What do biblical angels look like? They look like wings and eyes. They look like wheels. They look like flying saucers, which is kind of weird. What they don't look like, rather disappointingly, is Michael Sheen and David Tennant in Good Omens. I like the idea that they look human-like because it would break our brains to see them as they really are. Mr. Darcy asks, why is every god in Greek mythology related to or f***ing Zeus or both? F***ing Zeus gets everywhere. F***ing Zeus is all over the place, which means that an awful lot of people are his descendants one way or another. The, the nice thing about gods is nobody ever expected you to emulate them. They are always as much a warning as they are aspirational. You may want to have godly powers, uh, but you don't want to behave like that. You definitely don't want to behave like Zeus. Invert Edit asks, what is Ragnarok essentially? Ragnarok essentially is the last great battle. Ragnarok essentially begins with everything going wrong. Uh, the weather goes wrong. The climate goes wrong. Winter does not end. There is famine. There is awfulness. People are miserable. Brother fights brother. Sister fights sister. Cousin fights cousin. There is a gigantic, awful civil war amongst the people. And then it gets worse. You get the frost giants coming out. They're led by Surtur, a fire god. 
and Loki and his children. And it is a monstrous, enormous, giant, and pretty much final battle that ends in everybody being dead. I haven't even mentioned that all of the dead Viking warriors get to come back on an enormous ship built of the fingernails and toenails of the dead, um, because that's just too weird. Uh, but they do, and is why you should always trim your nails. However, Ragnarok kind of has a happy ending, because after all of the awfulness of Ragnarok, and after pretty much everybody has died, the few people who don't die get to sort of look at the ruins of where Asgard was, and everything gently starts to grow again and to begin again. Molly asks, why is all German folklore and mythology absolutely terrifying? What was wrong with people? I think it's something to do with the food, frankly. It could be the cold. But it is absolutely true that Germanic folklore is terrifying. It's filled with adults eating children. It's filled with famine. It's filled with nightmare. It's filled with murder and awful things happening. People like horror stories sometimes because it actually makes them feel better. Next up, Green Boy 494 has a question. In Norse mythology, what are the most known gods? You know, it is good that you're asking me that question because I wrote Norse mythology by Neil Gaiman. And um, as such, I could tell you that Odin is probably the most important. Frigg, his wife, also well known. Thor, very well known, gets movies made. Uh, Loki, in the movies, Loki is Thor's brother. In the mythology, Loki is Odin's blood brother, not actually related, and one of the giants, but not the big kind. Those are probably the most known gods. Water Dragon Nana asks, why is death so adorable in the Sandman? Death is so adorable in the Sandman because I wanted to create the kind of death that I would like to meet when my life is over. And I thought I would like a death who is practical, a death who is sensible, and a death who is above all kind. The mythology of Sandman is not world mythology. I should say that the mythology of Sandman is the mythology of a comic that I created, which includes in it seven entities who are not gods, who are not worshipped, but are essentially more powerful than gods because gods die when they are forgotten, but the endless are always there. And one of those seven is death. Vodam46 says, isn't Loki already gender fluid in Norse mythology? Uh, yeah, Loki cheerfully transforms into um, female form and is very happy doing so. Uh, Loki becomes a mare at one point to while away a, uh, a stallion who is just about to finish bringing the stones to build a wall for the gods. And uh, if the stallion cannot be stopped, then the gods are gonna lose the sun, the moon and the beautiful Freya. Loki is told to stop them and Loki in a horse form, in mare form, she lures that stallion away and then turns up about a year later as Loki with an eight-legged foal, a little horse, which is presented to Odin as Odin's horse. Gender fluid as hell, absolutely. Nathan K20 asks, what is Pandora's box? Well, first of all, Pandora's box isn't a box. Pandora's box is a jar. Zeus leads a war against the Titans, who basically are Zeus's parents. The gods win. They have various people on their side, including a couple of Titans. Um, their names are Prometheus and Epimetheus. And Epimetheus is given a gift by the gods. And the gift he is given is Pandora. And everything's great until one day 
She, out of curiosity or for whatever reason, smashes a jar that she has in which all of the things that are bad, all of the things that make life hard, the way that the story is sometimes told, that remains after all of the evils in the world have flown out into the world, is hope. I've never been quite sure how to interpret that, because you can think of hope as remaining as being this wonderful, pure, happy thing. Or you can think of it as the final cruelty of the gods, as they've, lost, they've loosed all of these terrible things upon us, and then just to make it a little worse, they've given us all hope. X asks, why did Icarus have to fly so close to the sun, bro? Well, it wasn't compulsory. Actually, his dad, Daedalus, explained to him that you don't fly close to the sun. They were escaping together using wings that Daedalus had made, and the wings were held together with wax. Those of us who think that if you go up, it's going to get cold, it would have been proved wrong in ancient Greek mythology because they knew that if you flew upwards, you would get too close to the sun and it would melt the wax. And if you went too far down over the waves, your wings would get wet. And what actually happened was the wings melted and Icarus, who aspired to go high, was drowned. Sierra Lachey asks, why Thor missing an eye, lol? Thor not missing an eye. You're thinking of Odin being Thor's dad, only has one eye. Odin is indeed missing an eye because he traded an eye for wisdom. Tarot Masks asks, says, something that's interesting to me is how so many different cultures have great flood myths. Like, why is that? Probably because over the years, there have been an awful lot of floods. And also because the great flood story does tend to get retold. I think one of the earliest versions we have of it is the, the Babylonian, the Assyrian version that definitely predates Noah. During the hundreds of thousands of years of human history, there were many times when there were floods huge floods and lots and lots of people died and somebody didn't. And the somebody who didn't got to live and tell the story. Next question is from Celio the Shaper. Oh, you're a Greek mythology fan? Name the 12 labors of Hercules. And then there is a clown face. The 12 labors of Hercules are kill the Nemean lion. It is important to remember that the Nemean lion is not the lion's that provided the lion skin that Hercules famously wore. That was a different lion. Uh, kill the, the hydra, the linear hydra. Every time you cut off its head, it grows two heads where the one that you cut off was. Hercules actually got a buddy to come in and cauterize the heads as he cut them off. Capture the Cyrenian hind. That was a deer, is a hind. The Aramanthian boar, you're starting to see an animal pattern here. And then you get a horsey one, which isn't capture horses, it's clean the stables. And this is the Aegean stables, the filthiest stables in the world. And he did that rather brilliantly, I have to say, by diverting a river. Then you've got the Stymphalian birds, these birds that would fly down and shit all over things and were awful and murderous, killed them all. The Cretan bull, got them. Then uh, we do get horses again, and this time it is actually capturing them, but these are uh, Diomedes' horses and they were man-eaters. You then have Hippolyta's belt and uh, or girdle and that one does not end well he's done fairly well dealing with animals but hippolyta is a lady and in order to obtain her girdle hercules has to head off into the land of the amazons they have a relationship it does not end well definitely doesn't end well for hippolyta who if memory serves kills herself for love of hercules uh which is really rather sad and he gets the belt 
You've got the Kettle of Geryon, and that's the original 10 labors of Hercules. And then he gets assigned another two because he got help on two of them. He has to do the Golden Apples of the Hesperides, and finally go to hell and bring back Cerberus, Kerberus, the three-headed dog of the underworld. T. Holtzerman, or Tholtzerman, asks, Greek mythology question. If two demigods bone and they have a kid, is that kid also a demigod? No, that would be a hemi-demigod. And obviously if their kids have sex, they will be semi-hemi-demigods. And beyond that, you get into crotchets and quavers and things. Well, that's all the questions. I hope you learned something. I had a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Here's to next time.